So in the last video, we talked about how to use integration to find the volume of a solid of revolution about either the x or the y axis. And in this video, we're going to extend the concept of applications of integration to finding other geometrical shapes. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to use an integral from a to b to find the arc length of a curve, a smooth curve represented by f of x. And we know f of x is just y, so we're going to have it like this. So basically what this is going to be is we're going to use an integral to find the arc length of this. So how can we find that? Well, we know the integral of f of x is going to give us the area under the curve. So that's what the integral is. But how will we go about to finding the length of that particular piece of curve? Well, let's say we want to zoom into a very small section of that. So the curve is going to look like this. And now let's say we want to break this apart into little sections delta L that are very, very small, and all of them have the same length. So delta L, delta L, and this is going to keep going back and forth, and that's going to cover the entire thing. So those little sections of delta L are going to add up to the total arc length. And now let's say we want to represent the total arc length between A and B as capital L. So what's L going to be? Well, L is going to be the sum of all those little contributions of length, or delta L, and then we're going to have a finite number of those contributions, and we're going to add them up, on, up until N. So we're going to have N number of delta L contributions to that total length. Now what happens as N goes to infinity? Because all of them have the same length, then as N goes to infinity, this should approach an integral and it is in fact going to become an integral because as n goes to infinity this very small quantity delta l is going to approach an infinitesimal quantity that we call dl so in the end we're going to end up with an integral of this form and that's pretty much the easiest way to derive the arc length of a function that we can come up with but we aren't done yet because remember what are we integrating here exactly? We have dl, but here we have a function of x. So I don't see x's here anywhere in this particular formula. So what do we need to do? Well, here is where we're going to use a little bit more of geometry to derive this. So if we take a piece of that curve, and now instead of taking those very big chunks of delta l, we take an infinitesimally small quantity, dl, then you can imagine that if you zoom into that, that is technically going to be a straight line because we know from the definition of a derivative that when you take the ratio of two infinitesimal small quantities you get a tangent line. So what is a tangent line? Well a tangent line is defined by dy over dx and that means that that straight line there that's just going to be the hypotenuse and the hypotenuse is going to be dl. So what is, according to Pythagoras' theorem, the relationship between those three quantities? Well, we know hypotenuse squared should be equal to dx squared plus dy squared. So that's what we're going to have there. But that's not the end of the story. Once again, we need dl. So dl is going to become square root of dx squared plus dy squared. And you might think, well, that's good enough to integrate. But remember, we need to integrate with respect to one differential element. And both differential elements are basically compromised here. They're inside a square root and they're square. So we cannot use them to integrate. So what can we use here? Well, let's use a little bit of algebraic manipulation. Let's multiply this square root by dx over dx because we know that this is the same as saying 1. So we're going to have dx squared plus dy squared multiply by this and now what we're going to have is we're going to move this dx the one at the bottom we're going to move it inside the square root so we're going to be left with dx square root of remember when we move something into a square root we have to square it so we're going to end up with dx over dx squared plus dy over dx squared so this is more to our liking because now we have a differential element on the outside and what we're going to integrate is this function here. 
But there's another simplification we can make because dx over dx is actually going to be one because that's by definition what that is. That's essentially canceling out those two differentials. That's just going to be one. So in the end, our differential element of length is going to be equal to dx times the square root of one plus the derivative of the function y over dx squared. And that works out because our function is defined by y, so y equals to f of x, which is the function for which we're finding the arc length. So we can say from this definition that our arc length is going to be equal to the integral from a to b of square root of 1 plus dy over dx squared times dx or we can rewrite it, rewrite it as integral of a to b of the square root of 1 plus the derivative of f so f prime x squared squared times dx so that's going to be our arc length and that's a very interesting thing that we can do with integrals now here's where it, the things might get very very interesting for you so what do you think is going to happen let's say that we were interested in rotating this particular curve about the x-axis so let's say we were interested in rotating that curve about the x-axis. What do you think is going to end up happening when we do that? Well, if you consider a piece of string and you hold it such that it stays, it retains the same shape as you rotate it about uh, a particular axis, then what is going to happen is that it is going to trace a silhouette around that x, and that silhouette is actually going to be the surface area of a volume formed by that. So just to illustrate that, I'm just going to draw a very simple diagram here. I'm going to get rid of all this stuff at the bottom. And now what we, I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate that such that we're going to end up with something like this. So this is A, this is B. And if we rotate it about the x-axis, we're going to actually make some kind of vase here. So. I should probably erase that um, ugly line that I did, that I made there. We're going to end up with some kind of pottery shape. I don't know what to call this, but that's essentially what we're going to get. And the whole thing is hollow. Remember that we're only rotating that curve around um, the axis X. So this whole thing is going to be hollow. So what is going to be um, the surface here, it's going to be the surface area. So let's see if we can use methods similar to what we used in the previous video for solid of revolution to derive an expression for the surface area of this particular solid. Well, it's not that complicated because you can see what is going to be the total, the total surface area here. We're rotating each point of f of x, so we're grabbing a point of f of x, and we're rotating it about the x-axis. So that means that the height or the distance between this point and that point is going to be f of x at some point j. And then we're just going to do that whole thing for the total arc length. So what's the arc length? Well, the arc length is yes. So how can we derive an expression for the surface area? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take an infinitesimally small an infinitesimally small contribution of length, dl, and we're going to rotate it about that. So in the end, our surface area is going to become the sum, the sum of those little contributions. So that's going to be 2 pi f of x j. So this is going to be the circumference of that circle as we rotate it about each point of j equals to 1 to n of times the little contribution of length, delta L. And as n goes to infinity, once again, we're going to get an integral. So the integral is going to be integral from A to B. And I'm going to write the 2 pi on the outside of f of x times the differential element dl. 
And we already discussed that the differential element DL is actually going to be defined as this. So we can rewrite this whole thing. We can rewrite this whole thing as follows. So the surface area of this solid of revolution is going to be 2 pi of the function from A to B, f of x times the square root of 1 plus the first derivative of f squared times dx. Or another way in which we can write this is going to be 2 pi integral from a to b of y times square root of 1 plus dy over dx times dx, making sure that y is defined as a function of x. So that's an alternative form in which we can write that. And if you use your intuition be, um, with what we have been doing so far, you can also derive an expression for the surface area for a solid of revolution that is rotated about the y-axis. So what happens if we grab the same piece of function and we rotate it about the y-axis? What is going to be the surface area of that? Well, it is simply going to be given by the formula. So if we rotate it about the y-axis, by definition, that should be equal to 2 pi of the integral from alpha to beta. I'm going to use different limits just to illustrate that they're going to be different to the limits from this. And that's going to be equal to the function y. Because remember, we're taking the same function once again. It's, it's the same. Um, actually, it shouldn't be y. It should be x, right? Because the circumference now is going to be defined by x. So the circumference is going to be defined by x. And this is going to be 1 plus dx over dy. Because remember, now x is a function of y. And we're going to take the derivative with respect to that. And this is going to be the element dy. So this is going to be the surface of the solid of revolution formed by rotating this particular curve about the y-axis. Because the circumference at each point x is going to be given by x and we're going to rotate it like this. All right, I think that's enough talking. Let's do some examples. So for the first example, I'm going to find the arc length of a curve. So let's just clear the whole screen. Let's get rid of all this stuff. And let's do some actual examples. So for the first example, I'm just going to solve for the arc length of the following curve. So this is going to be the function 3x y x from 0 to 5 so that means that at that point we're going to have y equals to 15 so let's find the arc length between those two points that's going to be 0 to 5 of the function 3x so in this case what we're going to have is 1 plus the derivative of this function squared so that's going to be the derivative of this is 3 so that's going to be 3 squared times dx which is the same as saying integral 0 to 5 of the square root of 10 dx. That's just a constant, so that comes out. That's square root of 10 times x, 5 to 0. And we end up with the following expression, 5 10. So that's going to be the arc length of that. Now, because this is a straight line, we can prove that very easily by using the Pythagoras theorem by finding the hypotenuse of this. So let's call this hypotenuse h. So we know h squared equals to 5 squared plus 15 squared. And then h is going to be square root of 25 plus 15 squared. And that actually comes out to the same value. So straight away we found the arc length of that curve very easily. It can be applied to any continuous function of x. And this is a very, very useful concept that we will be using in the future as well when we define what line integrals are and we get more involved with multivariable calculus. But for now, just know that arc length is defined as this integral. Okay, so now that we have shown an example of that, let's try and find the surface area of a solid of revolution using the formulas we just derived. So for the solid of revolution, I am going to consider the following curve. So let's have y equals to square root of 4 
minus x squared and we're going to find the surface area between the boundaries minus 1 and 1. So what that means is that we're going to have the derivative of this is going to be dy of dx. Remember we're going to use the chain rule here so that's going to be half of 4 minus x squared to the power of 1 over 2 times the derivative of the inside which is in this case 2x that cancels out and in the end we end up with minus x over square root of 4 minus x squared so that's going to be the derivative there now obviously we are going to need to square this to put it into our arc length function so this is going to come out to be x squared over 4 minus x squared and that means that our surface area of revolution is going to be 2 pi from minus 1 to plus 1 and now we're going to have the function itself y so square root of 4 minus x squared times the arc length component which is going to be 1 plus this element which is x squared over 4 minus x squared times dx and this seems like a very complicated integral to make but we can actually solve it by using very simple um, algebraic substitution and some manipulation around so let's move this particular function inside this other square root so remember when you move an element into a square root what you need to do is you need to square it so this is the same as writing this is the same as writing big square root times what happens when a square root when you square it it just becomes it disappears so we have x squared plus 4 minus x squared times x squared over 4 minus x squared this cancels out with that one and that, that tells us that this has to cancel out with that one so in the end this actually came out to be a very very simple integral because we're just going to have that constant so 2 pi of the integral from minus 1 to plus 1 square root of 4 which is 2 so this is going to be 4 pi of x from minus 1 to 1 and this is going to be 4 pi minus minus 4 pi which is equal to 8 pi so 8 pi unit squared is going to be the surface area of this function when it is rotated about the x-axis between the boundaries minus 1 and 1 on the x-axis so this is, you can see that these formulas and these derivations are very useful because we're applying integrals in entirely new ways that we wouldn't have thought were possible. But that's just to show you the many, uh, few of the many applications of integrals. And in future videos, we're going to be looking at a lot more applications of integration, not just to geometry, but to a lot of things that are very practical in the real world. So I hope you enjoyed this video and that you learned something very useful, not just uh, in the sense of what integrals can be useful, but about how to derive expressions and formulas involving integrals by using the concept of infinitesimal quantities. And in the next video, we're going to look at how we can apply both integration and differentiation to talk about kinematics of particles and how to treat rates of change and find functions that relate velocity to acceleration and displacement of a particle.